thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me. If you could have the slides, please. So bridging the gap between AI and human intelligence, uh, we are very far from building intelligent machines at the level that uh, 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 humans uh, are, or even uh, relatively simple animals. There are certain things we can do with AI, and a lot of things that we cannot do, and I'm, I'm gonna try to kind of tell you a little bit of this, about the state of the art and about what's missing, I think. Uh, so it, it's a little complicated because our vision of AI is a little conditioned by, um, by Hollywood. And, and so the question is whether future AI would be more like, like HAL 9000 or Terminator or more like, like 3PO uh, in, in Star Wars and or can some sort of mixture of the two here. Um, and it's, a, it's an important question for the future, which I'll come back at the end of the talk, but I'll start with a little bit of history. So a, a lot of the methods that we hear about today are essentially a, a, a due to a new set of techniques that we call deep learning, which is really a rebranding of uh, what we used to call neural nets. And the first neural net uh, goes back to the, the 50s uh, um, and, and with the, the perceptron, which at the time was an analog computer. And it kind of set the stage for the, the model of pattern recognition and machine learning for the next uh, 50 years almost until fairly recently, uh, where most of the system is actually built by hand and the learning part is very really restricted. So it set the stage also for a model of learning that's called supervised learning, where the, 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 the type of, of learning that takes place is that you, you want a machine, for example, to distinguish cars from airplanes, you uh, train it with examples of cars and airplanes. So for example, you want, uh, the machine to produce, uh, to turn on the red light that corresponds for a car when you show it a car and the green light when it's uh, an airplane, you show it an example of a car and you adjust the synaptic weights in the neural net or the parameters, whatever they are, symbolized by those knobs here so that the brightness of the, of the car light uh, goes up and the brightness of the uh, plane light goes down and, and reverse for, uh, for planes. So if you show sufficiently many examples of each of the categories and if the machine is powerful enough, it will eventually figure out figure out the intrinsic difference between cars and airplanes. Uh, and you'll be able to generalize to uh, new uh, uh, instances of those objects it's never seen before. That's kind of the magic of uh, machine learning a little bit, if there is any magic to it. Um, so what uh, deep learning has brought to the table is the model by which the learning system is basically a cascade of modules, all of which are trainable. So it's a, a far cry from the early systems where most of it was essentially designed by hand, hand engineered, and then the, only the last step was trainable. Uh, so it's called deep learning because of the number of layers and the depth of the system. And the idea uh, is very old. It goes, it goes back to the idea of using multiple layers goes back uh, many decades, except that the learning algorithms to be able to train those systems appropriately uh, only popped up around the, the mid 80s or so, or was popularized uh, around the mid 80s. So one question we have to ask ourselves, of course, if you want to, to build a, a system that, for example, recognizes images, what architecture should we uh, give it? What should we put in those, in those trainable boxes? And there we can get a little bit of uh, inspiration from, from neuroscience uh, and you know, the basic uh, uh, classic work in the visual neuroscience by you know, Hubel and Weasel and, and others um, uh, that kind of uh, you know, shows that the, uh, re the recognition, the fast recognition of everyday objects in the brain is, uh, is very fast and essentially a feed forward process. And so that led to the creation of an uh, architecture that uh, I've been working on uh, for, for about 30 years now called convolutional networks, uh, now called deep convolutional ne networks, uh, which is sort of the dominant method nowadays for image recognition and speech recognition in industry. So if you talk to your telephone, um, and, and your voice is being recognized, it's a convolutional net that does that. If you um, upload your photos on Facebook or, or Google, they be, they're being recognized and it's also a convolutional net that does that. If you have a self-driving car and with a camera looking at the window, uh, it's also a convolutional net that does that. So it's a very uh, successful architecture and it's really inspired by, by neuroscience to, to, to a large extent. It doesn't attempt to copy all the details, but it sort of gets a little bit of inspiration the same way airplanes are inspired by, by birds in the sense that they have wings, but of course the details very different. So why do we need all those layers? We need all those layers to be able to let the system uh, learn hierarchical representations of the world where the low-level features that are extracted by the system are uh, very simple motifs like uh, oriented edges, very similar to uh, what neuroscientists tell us uh, uh, neurons in V1 are doing. And then you, do, you go a couple layers up and, and you, you find uh, units in those conventional nets that identify slightly more complex motifs like corners and circles and gratings and things of that type. And then you do a couple more layers up, you go a couple more layers up and you see uh, neurons that detect uh, parts of objects 
and then objects, and then interprets the entire scene, and things like this. So you get this sort of compositional hierarchy that uh, uh, those systems can essentially learn from data just by being shown examples together with labels, uh, supervised learning. So why, um, why is it that hierarchical structures uh, capture, seem to be capturing something about natural data? And it's probably because the world is compositional. So uh, Einstein famously said, uh, the most incomprehensible thing about the world is that it's comprehensible. And it's probably because the world is compositional. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, particles are, are formed by more elementary particles, atoms by particles, uh, molecules by atoms, and, and uh, you know, materials by assembly of, of molecules, et cetera. And then you can go up the hierarchy, as we were talking about earlier, uh, uh, in, uh, but when talking about physics. So something is, is very similar in, in perception, where uh, uh, perceptual objects are formed by more elementary objects that you can detect uh, combinations of. And so there is uh, a, uh, a saying that I think is particularly appropriate to say within this uh, venue. Uh, my, my friend Jason Eisner from Johns Hopkins University says the world is compositional or there is a God. Inclusive or. <laughs> Possibly inclusive or, yes. Um, so, um, uh, there's been an inflation of the number of layers that those networks uh, uh, have been using over the last few years, and the, the latest ones, the ones that work best, uh, that are actually deployed for image recognition, have something like 100 layers or so. And so they, they start to be a little more like recurrent nets, really, have you know, some sort of dynamics to them. Um, and typically, they, they have billions of connections. Uh, I'm talking about practical networks, so the ones that are uh, used to recognize, for example, the, the 1 billion or 1.5 billion photos that Facebook users upload on Facebook every day. It's every day. Um, every single one of those photos goes through three convolutional nets of this type that uh, identify objects and images, identify faces, at least if you're not in Europe, and uh, also um, 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 generates disc textual description of images for, for, for the visually impaired uh, and, and do content filtering and things of that type. And those, those systems have uh, hundreds of millions of adjustable uh, parameters in the form of those simulated synapses between, uh, between neurons. Uh, so it's very uh, heavy computationally, but, uh, but computers are getting pretty fast. So you know, pretty early on, we kind of uh, uh, understood that those systems could be used for all kinds of things, recognizing multiple objects, detecting faces. And more, more recently, um, there have been uh, uh, my animation doesn't seem to, to run. Okay, here we go. Uh, things seem to be a little slow here. Apologies. Hmm. Okay. Um, Oh, very slow. Okay, here we go. I'm not sure what's going on. Uh, so, so we can we can use them to um, uh, recognize multiple objects. As I was uh, saying bef before, after uh, Wolf Singer's uh, uh, talk, uh, we don't seem to need any explicit mechanism to let those systems be able to segment objects from each other and from their background. Um, uh, some of those ideas have been uh, picked up. Uh, I mean, we did some work on uh, uh, semantic segmentation, which is the idea of segment, basically labeling every pixel in an image with a category of the object that, uh, uh, that it belongs to. And some of those ideas have been picked up extremely quickly by companies like Mobileye and NVIDIA to build vision systems for self-driving cars. So uh, those technologies are going to revolutionize transportation. They probably are going to revolutionize a lot about society as well, in the sense that people, uh, uh, are not going to need to own cars anymore because you can order it from your smartphone, um, and and you know cities are going to be transformed because of this. So it's going to have a lot of societal impact within the next decade, perhaps a couple of decades. Uh, the state of the art in computer vision is is making progress. Now we have systems that uh, can essentially not just recognize objects but also localize them very accurately, including the outline. So these are the result of a system that was built at Facebook for uh, uh, you know a particular uh, competition. It's not deployed uh, commercially or anything, but you know, we can pick out people who we, whom we only see the, the head, uh, can pick out very fuzzy people in the background and segment the person from a frisbee. This is essentially a giant convolutional network applied to the image at multiple scales with a lot of tricks. You can pick out broccoli in Chinese dishes. You can, uh, you can even count sheeps. Um, so these are things that computer vision scientists, uh, if they had been asked five years ago, would have said, these are extremely difficult problem. We may not be able to solve them within the next 10 years, and, and now we have them. So uh, progress has been uh, extremely quick, partly because the popularity of those methods have, have brought a lot of 
very smart people to work on the question. So now let me talk about obstacles to AI. Um, so to, to be intelligent, to be truly intelligent, a machine needs to be able to perceive, and we have a good handle on that, as uh, I just showed. Machines need to be able to predict, predict what's gonna happen in the future, fill in the blanks for information, you know, incomplete information. So uh, our brains, for example, fill in the area of our visual cortex that is where, you know, our blind spot where our, our uh, optical nerve punches through our, our retina. Um, we're not conscious of this because our brain kind of fills it in. Um, if you are on this side, you probably only, look, you, you only see my uh, right profile, but you can pretty much figure out what my left profile looks like because uh, you, you're kind of used to seeing faces and, and sort of complete. So there's a lot of missing information we can do by, by predicting or retrodicting or filling in the blanks. Um, we are pretty good at estimating the state of the world, or at least our immediate environment, so that we can make those predictions. Um, but we, machines need also to be able to reason and plan and sort of remembering uh, things about, about the past. So the combination of perception, predictive models, memory, reasoning and planning is really what are needed for building intelligent machines. So the, the question of how you do reasoning um, is um, something that uh, Demis and I just alluded to uh, at the end of the previous talk where uh, there is this idea of augmenting a recurrent neural net with an explicit memory, uh, hopefully a differentiable memory so it can be integrated in the learning algorithms that uh, we use to train those systems. Um, so there's a, a system of this type called memory network that was uh, proposed by people at Facebook. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, a stack augmented recurrent net, which is kind of a similar idea also by people at Facebook in New York. And uh, uh, the neural training machine, uh, I think, was fairly simultaneous. The papers appeared within three days of each other on archive. So I think people were working on the same ideas about the same time. Um, and then the more recently, uh, uh, DeepMind's work on the differentiable neural computer. Uh, so something I'm, I'm gonna tell you about is a little bit how those, those memories work. So they are kind of circuits that it would be interesting to see, uh, since there are neuroscientists uh, in the audience, whether the architecture we use for those associative memory modules are kind of similar to what the hippocampus uh, uh, does in the, in the brain, um, um, you know, depending on the various hypotheses. Uh, what we use those things for is building a natural language understanding systems. So systems that can answer questions, for example, about a text. So you get the machine to read a text, remember it, store it in its memory, and then you uh, train it to answer questions by giving it a question about the text and then giving it the correct answer and then using backpropagation to train the system so that it learns to figure out which part of the memory is relevant for a particular type of question. Uh, so the little, the little diagram you see at the, at the right is basically a time unfolded version of this memory network with, with the recurrent net associated with it. And it can do things like, you know, read a short text like this one, which is sort of a 15 sentence version of Lord of the Rings, uh, including the end, and, uh, and then ask questions about, you know, where, where, is, uh, you know, where is Bilbo or where is the ring, etc. In fact, uh, my colleagues at Facebook uh, came up with a list of 20 types of different questions that those systems uh, might be able to answer, things that might require a little bit of inference, something like uh, Sam walks into the kitchen, Sam picks up an apple, Sam walks into the bedroom, Sam drops the apple, where is the apple? Um, or Brian is a lion, Julius is a lion, Julius is white, Bernard is green, what color is Brian? If you assume all lions are white, um, then uh, Brian is white. So things like this, uh, there's sort of 20 types of questions and, and those memory networks uh, in their original form can solve uh, 18 or 19 of them. Uh, but recently, uh, very recently, in fact, uh, the paper is uh, just, just popped up on archive a few weeks ago, uh, we came up with this thing called the Entity Recurrent Nets, which is sort of a distributed memory recurrent net. So it's, you could think of it as kind of an array of, uh, or, or a, 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 a bank of recurrent neural nets with associated memory to them, and each of them is meant to represent an entity in the world, either a room or an object or something like this. And every time a, a sentence or a percept is given to the system, it's, it's supposed to learn which part of the memory should be updated to kind of keep an updated state of the world. So it's a way to kind of uh, build a machine that maintains a, a kind of sparse representation of the, of the state of the world. Uh, and that system is the first one that we know of that can solve all 20 of those, uh, of those tasks, um, including things like counting and, and, and things that have to do with geometry and things like this. So um, it's um, interesting progress. But really what we want machines to be able to do is acquire common sense. So what, is, what does that mean? And it's a, a, a very constant theme in, in AI uh, that computers don't have common sense. So there is a, 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 a famous uh, standard set of problems in AI called uh, Winograd schemas. Uh, and they are sentences of the type, the trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it's too large. 
and you can tell that the it refers to the trophy, or the trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it's too small, in which case the it refers now to the suitcase. And what allows you to lift the ambiguity about what this pronoun refers to is your knowledge of the world, your knowledge of you know, what you're supposed to do with trophies and suitcases. Um, if I say uh, Stan picked up his bag and left the room, uh, which I hope he's not doing, um, the, you can infer a lot, of, uh, inf a lot of information that's missing from this sentence but you, that you can infer because you know how the world works. You know he's going to have to stand up, extend his arm, close his arm around his bag, walk out, probably not fly, not, di not disintegrate like this, this person here, um, and, and go through the door and probably is not going to go through the wall. He uh, has superpowers, but maybe not those. So, um, uh, so that th this knowledge of the world, of, of the constraints of the physical world, allow you to fill in the blanks, and that's really what what's missing from 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 computers. Um, so, how do we get how how do we get machine to to learn that kind of knowledge? Um, uh, and and much of humans and human and animal learning that learn everything about the world is unsupervised. It's not like babies are told the name of every object they're looking at. Uh, they figure out a lot of properties about the world without being told anything. And it's the same for animals, of, of course. Um, so that led me to uh, a kind of slightly obnoxious uh, uh, statement and slide, uh, particularly obnoxious. Some of my friends from DeepMind are in the room. But, uh, <laughs> um, but it, 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 in fact, um, our opinions on this are not very different, uh, but the, uh, the statement that uh, the, the amount of information a system needs to get from the, from the world to be able to learn appropriately uh, is, is extremely large, needs to be extremely large. If we want to train a very, very large uh, neural net or some other learning machine with many, many parameters, we need to ask it to predict a lot of things. And uh, uh, a standard model for learning, uh, sort of, you know, biologically relevant learning, is, is reinforcement learning, where basically you wait for the machine or an animal to uh, do a proper action, and then you reward uh, this machine or this animal, or you punish it if, if it doesn't do the right thing. That works, but it works in situations where you can run millions and millions and millions of examples. So it works very well for games, so it's extremely successful, for example, for Go playing. Uh, the, DeepMind uh, system AlphaGo was, tr was trained this way partially. It was also trained with supervised learning. Um, but um, uh, that works extremely well f when, when you can generate millions of examples. But in the real world, the, you can't generate that many examples. The real world is, uh, one problem with the real world is yeah, you can't run it faster than real time. Um, so supervised learning, this is what I talked about. This is what uh, you know, the, the vast majority of applications of AI today use. And what we don't know really how to do is unsupervised learning. So that's, that's what I'm going to talk about next. But first, I need to talk about the architecture of an intelligent system. So what, is a, what would be the architecture of an intelligent system? So if you look at, um, uh, if you want an intelligent agent, this agent generates actions that influence the world or the environment that the agent acts uh, into or is part of. The world responds with percepts or observations that uh, give out some information about its internal state. And then the agent has to kind of generate actions that will eventually make it happy. How does it determine whether it's happy or not? There is an objective, the, the red box at the bottom, uh, which basically tells the system, uh, looks at the internal state of the system, is really part of the agent, and, and, and tell the system you're happy or you're not happy. And what the system wants to do is uh, optimize the long-term value of this objective. So keep itself happy, uh, keep away from uh, unhappy things. And, you know, the... the at a conceptual level, the, the brain of, of uh, uh, animals and humans are kind of organized this way, uh, in some way. So this is the idea of intrinsic motivation, what the objective implements is the intrinsic drives and motivations of, uh, of the agent. Um, now, for the agent to be intelligent, it has to be, uh, you know, it could try many things in the world to see what works, but again, the world is slow, and there are things that you try that might kill you. So what you really want is you want uh, the agent to have a, a, a simulator, a world simulator, some sort of model of the world that allows it to predict what's going to happen in the world uh, because the world is being the world or as a consequence of its actions. And so inside of the agent, there is a world simulator. Uh, there is an actor that generates action proposals or sequences of actions. And then there's a critic, which is essentially uh, a module that estimates the long-term value of the uh, objective, the expected long-term value of the objective. So this is where sub-goals can be defined and things like this. 
So if you kind of run this for multiple time steps, uh, there is a per set that comes in that gives uh, some idea of the initial state of the world, and then uh, you can think of this as kind of some sort of giant uh, recurrent neural net that you can train to optimize the uh, you know, ultimate objective function. And we know how to build the actor, we know how to build the critic, the, those are kind of traditional neural nets. Uh, to some extent, what we don't know how to build really is the world simulator. And so how, how do we learn predictive models of the world? That's the big question. So um, uh, in control theory, that's called uh, uh, system identification. In uh, you know, other contexts, it has many names, but it's basically, can you train a neural net to predict uh, what's gonna happen in the, in the physical world, for example, qualitative physics? Uh, there's a number of, of work on this. In fact, Josh Tenenbaum, who should be here, uh, has worked on, on, on some of those things. Um, so these are experiments that were done by my colleague, colleagues at Facebook, uh, Adam Lehrer, Sam Gross, Rob Fergus, uh, uh, earlier this year and last year, where they tried to predict whether a, a tower of, of blocks is going to fall and where the blocks are going to fall. And this is trained using a, a game engine with a physics engine, so it can do those, those kind of prediction. And it works pretty well, but it makes fuzzy predictions. So what you see in the kind of the second row are of each of those little uh, blocks of four images, of three images, are, are the predictions. And, and in some cases, you see those predictions being very fuzzy because the system really can't uh, exactly predict where those things are going to fall. And that's a problem. Uh, that's, in fact, the main technical problem we have to solve. So if, uh, for example, I want to build a, a predictive system that looks at the snippet of video, uh, a few frames from a video of, for example, me putting a, a pen on the table, and then uh, I let the pen go and I ask the system, what is the world going to look like uh, a quarter second from now? Uh, of course, it should predict that the pen is going to fall, but it's very hard for it to predict in which direction the, the pen is going to fall. So there is an intrinsic unpredictability uh, in, the, in the world. Um, and one way to handle this is, uh, uh, so one, one problem with this is that if we use traditional learning techniques, which are uh, kind of supervised learning techniques, we can show to the machine what the future looks like, and then we can tell it, train yourself so you predict the future. But since there are ma many plausible futures, it can't really do a good job at predicting. So what we need is a way to tell the machine, you made the wrong prediction, but conceptually that prediction was right. So as long as the prediction is in this red ribbon, which is kind of the set of plausible uh, futures, you're okay. And we don't know how to characterize this red ribbon other than by training another machine. So that led to an idea, which is I think the best idea in machine learning in the last 10 or 20 years, proposed by Ian Goodfellow when he was a student with uh, Yosha Bengio, uh, University of Montreal called adversarial training. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but essentially it allows a system to be trained uh, with uncertainty about the output, and it uses a second neural net to uh, train the, the, the objective function, if you want, that d determines whether a prediction is plausible or not. Um, so those, um, th this system, has, has, this idea has led to uh, stunning results in systems that can generate images or, or predict the future in video. Those are artificially generated uh, bedroom pictures generated by one of those adversarially trained neural net, and they look like really nice bedrooms. They're not like any real bedroom, but they, they've been trained with thousands of images of bedrooms, and they have a bed and a window and a dresser and uh, lighting and all that stuff. You can interpolate between mega characters, you can do algebra on faces, you can uh, generate images like this. If you are a little far away or if you're a little uh, myopic, you might think that those are very nice looking images with a object in the center, but in fact, when you look closely, there's actually no object that you can recognize in those images. So this is a, 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 a you know, one of those adversarially trained uh, uh, network um, to, to generate images. It's been trained on the ImageNet dataset. Uh, if you train it on dogs, you get soft dogs. You get Salvador Dali dogs kind of thing. Um, so it captures the general statistics of those images, but not the details properly. And you can train it also to do video prediction. So here are some example of results uh, where the example at the top right, where you get b fuzzy predictions, is using a traditional supervised learning algorithm to train the system to predict. And the ones, uh, the, the six uh, other uh, little animations, the first four frames are observed, and the last two frames in each sequence is predicted. And it does a pretty good job at kind of predicting what's, what's going to happen next. These are other examples of those predictions, uh, where the, when the, the frame turns red, that's when the prediction starts. So these are uh, examples where the system, if you look at the image at the bottom in the middle, it's a bookcase, and as the camera moves, the system has to invent what the bookcase looks like in places where it doesn't see it, and, and it kind of figures out what, what it should look like, more or less. Uh, it doesn't work, you know, if you try to predict too long in the future, like, you know, after 10 or 20 frames, it gets really fuzzy.
So what, uh, will, the future, what will future AI systems be like? Um, uh, humans and animals' uh, behavior has basic drives that are hard hardwired by evolution that make us uh, uh, you know, do our sort of basic behavior. And we need to build this into machines as well, uh, just uh, possibly as a safeguard, but also as a way to drive their behavior. Uh, humans uh, can do bad things to each other, mostly because of these drives, uh, which are built into ourselves for self-preservation. So we want, you know, we kind of become violent under threat. We have a desire for material resources and social power. And there is no reason machines will have this unless we explicitly build that into them. So I'm not in the camp that believes that uh, machines will necessarily be dangerous if they are intelligent, because they also need the motivation to, to, do, so, to do so. Um, so it all depends on what uh, this uh, you know, objective function is that we built into them for, to drive their behavior. Um, it's difficult for us to, uh, humans to imagine an intelligent entity without all the human drives, because that's the only example of intelligent entity that we are familiar with. But in fact, there are many other types of intelligence. As a manager of a research uh, uh, lab, I'm uh, very familiar with the idea of working with people who are much more intelligent than me, and it's not because they're more intelligent than me that they necessar necessarily want my job. So, you know, it's the same with machines. I think they can be very intelligent without necessarily wanting to dominate humanity. Um, and so, in a sense, morality and intelligence are orthogonal concepts, and you can have, uh, you know, both all combinations. Um, so to make uh, AI machines safe, we need to build uh, basic immutable hardware drives, and uh, that's, that would be the best way to prevent uh, unsafe AI from, from, ha from happening. Um, let's see, I want to just show my last slide. Uh, so uh, a few other things, uh, emergence of human level AI will not be an event, it would be progressive. Uh, you know, perhaps when we solve those problems of unsupervised and reinforcement learning, or what's called also model-based reinforcement learning, really, in some, uh, some context. It will not happen in isolation. There's no single entity that has a monopoly on good ideas. So neither Facebook, nor Google, nor Microsoft, nor IBM will come up with the solution to AI, and from one day to the next, they'll be the only one to build intelligent machines. We're all kind of within, you know, a, a few months of each other and certain topics. So uh, it's not gonna happen in isolation or in secret. Uh, no research of good quality happens in secret. That's good news. Um, and a majority of good ideas still come from academia, which is kind of uh, open by design. Um, advancing AI is a scientific question right now, not a, really a technical challenge yet. Uh, and uh, uh, um, I think uh, it's important to distinguish intelligence from autonomy, as I was talking about earlier. So, um, you know, will AI be benevolent? Um, uh, I think uh, we need to design it for it, but I, I don't think it's an insurmountable technical problem. And uh, will it be morally wrong to disconnect them, for example, like in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey? Uh, it won't be immoral if they don't care. Thank you very much.